for the better, and we need to support them. Fifth, we need to be the front line of freedom and defense for America. Given our location and our large veteran population, Alaska is destined to play this critical role. I like to say that our state constitutes three pillars of America's military might. We are the cornerstone of our nation's missile defense. We are the hub of air combat power for the Asia Pacific and the Arctic. And we are a platform for expeditionary forces for some of the best trained American troops to leave from our state to hot spots in the world. I was with some of these troops in Afghanistan over the holidays. Alaska's very own 4th Brigade of the 25th Infantry Division, what we call the 425. Two years ago, this 5,000-member airborne unit was on the verge of being eliminated by the Obama administration. We reversed this misguided policy, and now our very own 425 is forward deployed defending our freedoms. And we're building on these pillars of the military in Alaska. Using my seat on the Armed Services Committee and Senator Murkowski's position on the Appropriations Committee, in the past three years, we've secured over $1 billion for military construction in our state, including $200 million to build a new missile field at Fort Greeley as part of a broader missile defense bill I authored last year. These military investments are not only critical for America's national security, they have the added benefit of bringing very good jobs to our state. And the front line of freedom in Alaska also includes some unsung heroes who don't get the attention they deserve. And that's the men and women of the United States Coast Guard. The Coast Guard is on, undergoing a major recapitalization effort right now. As chairman of the subcommittee in charge of the Coast Guard, I've been working with the Coast Guard's leadership to include that this recapitalization will mean more ships, more aircraft, and more personnel throughout our great state. And finally, we want to be the land of the future, where opportunities are unleashed for our families and children that we can't begin to fathom today. We are blessed with so many unique advantages relative to other places in the world. You know them, but sometimes it's important to talk about them. Our vast natural resources, including boundless renewable energy, huge deposits of metals and minerals, more shoreline than all other states combined, the most strategic location from which to take advantage of the Asia Pacific economic renaissance, Alaska Native corporations, which drive our economy, and one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds. We have a great diversity of people and cultures. We have a geography and climate worthy of study by the finest scientific minds. We have the promise of a new Arctic frontier. We have a midnight sun in the summer, and in the winter, electrical charged particles dance in our skies. Who else has that? We can ski to our offices on world-class cross-country ski trails that produce Olympic gold medalists like Keek and Randall. I knew Keek and Randall would almost get as large of an applause line as my wife, Julie. And on the weekends, adventure beckons. We climb mountains, snow machine, fish our salmon-choked rivers, pick berries on our tundra, and hunt to put food on the table. Alaska has always been a place that celebrates big ideas and big thinkers with a unique combination of frontier and entrepreneurial spirit. Let's never lose that. Cynicism can dampen and extinguish that unique Alaska fire. Whatever we do or don't do, let's not let that happen to us. So what are we doing in D.C. to keep that Alaska fire burning? Well, most recently, we passed historic tax legislation. Middle-class Alaskans will see hundreds of dollars more 
in take-home pay each month, which will <laughs> and this will help our families offset permanent fund dividend cuts. Thousands of Alaskans are also receiving bonuses and increased benefits from companies doing business here because of the tax reform bill. This is real money that will help stretch family budgets during these lean times. The new tax bill also helps our families by incentivizing paid parental leave. Our small businesses will also see reduced tax burdens and will be given the incentive to reinvest their extra money here to help us get out of this recession. As for science, we have so much potential to be a vibrant hub of research, but the federal government can be a much better partner. One example, I'm a huge supporter of NOAA. I chair the committee in charge of NOAA. Yet so much of NOAA staffing, research, and infrastructure for Alaska-based missions are not located in Alaska. I have a commitment from the incoming NOAA administrator to help us fix this. Bringing those NOAA research and personnel to Alaska while ensuring a strong university system throughout our state will help provide a new generation of scientific opportunities for our children. We should always remember that entrepreneurs can live anywhere in the country to start new businesses, to start new ventures. Our unique attributes can attract and keep some of the most adventurous, creative people in the world. We must ensure that our policies, whether state or federal, welcome those who come north to the future. Our great land greets them with open arms, and we must too with opportunities in telecoms, and server farms, and data centers, and carbon fiber, in our fertile soils, and aviation, and logistics, and opportunities provided by our cold climate, in tourism, in our unique native arts and crafts, and in our enormous alternative energy potential. What I've tried to do this morning is lay out a vision of what a bright future for Alaska should and could look like. I would, of course, love to hear opportunities that you are seeing across our state. One thing, though, I know, and I think you know, too, is there is no limit to what we can achieve when we nurture and cultivate our big ideas and our Alaska frontier spirit. So shortly after the Prudhoe Bay lease in 1969, a Washington Post reporter wrote about what Alaska's newfound riches might mean for the future of our state. He interviewed tough, independent homesteaders, miners, trappers, fishermen, and women, he wrote, who could, quote, change a flat tire on a one-ton truck in a blizzard. <laughs> there was a tremendous excitement in our state, but also at anxiety with what our newfound riches might bring. Alaska might end up being like so many places in the lower 48, wrung out, dull, overcrowded, polluted. We knew then, like we know today, that our future ideal had to be more than just about having money. It was also a purpose, a sense of creating a place where both freedom of spirit adventure, and community are interwoven. So what's happened since 1969 in that lease sale? Well, I think we've done a pretty darn good job of creating a unique place that we love and is full of opportunity. There are setbacks, of course, but working together, Alaskans have built the best, most unique state in America. We still have homesteaders and miners and trappers we still have women who can change a flat tire on a one-ton truck in a blizzard. I bet there's even a few in this room. And I know that we have serious challenges. But you have my commitment to work through those challenges together and at the same time bring the spirit of excitement and creation back to our state. 
I believe that we have a unique opportunity and maybe only a short period of time to once again set the course to realize Alaska's promising future. The moment is now. We must seize it together. Thank you. God bless the great state of Alaska. Senator, we have about three questions if, you're, right. if you want to answer them. Sure. Representative Drummond. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much, Mr. Senator, for pushing forward on the opioid issue. Your colleague, the junior senator from New York, recently called out Big Pharma for opposing legal marijuana because it cuts into their profits. Medical marijuana has been shown to steer people away from addictive op opioids for solutions to chronic pain and without killing them through overdoses. I hope you will be open-minded on this issue, Senator, because in the meantime, legalized marijuana has boomed in Alaska, providing jobs for thousands of Alaskans, growing, harvesting, processing, and generating millions in state revenue, one of our only sources of new revenue, I have to, I have to remark. What will you do, Senator, to protect Alaskans and this new industry if the Trump administration acts on its hostile stance towards states who've legalized marijuana? Thank you. It's a great question. And, uh, you know, at the, the beginning of that question, when you talked about the opioid crisis, you know, I think it's important for all of you to know there's a very strong bipartisan focus on this back in Washington. And as we talked about this, for those of you who are at the Wellness Summit and the Matsu college a couple of years ago, you know, this has the potential to devastate entire communities. Indeed, it is. It is in many parts of the country. Um, and we can't allow that to happen here, although it's a huge challenge. Look, on the medical marijuana issue, I think I, I was, uh, when I ran for office in, in 2014, that's when the statewide initiative was on the ballot. Um, I was asked about it during that time. Um, I said I wasn't supportive, uh, but it passed, as a matter of fact, it passed overwhelmingly in, uh, in Alaska. So I'm a big believer in the Tenth Amendment and what states focus on. So back in Washington, I've been very focused with Senator Murkowski, Congressman Young, on allowing the federal government to work with the states who have legalized marijuana to do it the right way. You know, during the Obama administration, there was this thing called the Cole Memo. And Attorney General, and that kind of said, hey, we won't come after you. If you actually read the memo, kind of said, we won't come after you, but. So in my view, even the Cole memo was not, was, uh, was not that strong enough to kind of help people here have certainty. And that's what I think is needed. So the key issue, from my perspective, is trying to move legislation. And there's a whole host of different approaches to this. Some of which, as you mentioned, is only focused on uh, medical marijuana. And so I have been working with some of my colleagues. It's an interesting group of senators because it's, it's very bipartisan. It actually is kind of from states like ours who have actually legalized uh, marijuana through statewide referendums. But to me, that's really the ultimate answer because if, and it's gonna take time, there's no doubt about it, because if you have this kind of back and forth between administrations on federal regs, like you're seeing now, it doesn't provide